Coming up today on Folks, a look at the feminist movement. Where does it stand today, and where is it going? Sonia Massengale will be talking to Lieutenant General Arthur Gregg of New Orleans, who is putting some of his military training to work in the television industry. Cheech and Chong, watch out, because up and coming are Chakula and Chink. I'm Rob Hinton. Those stories and more today on Folks. Everybody says folks, just plain old folks. Everybody just people all over the world. Oh, folks to live, folks got to give, folks got to care, ooh, folks got to share. Hello everyone and welcome to Folks. Our first story today is about the women's movement. More and more we are seeing women making it into the mainstream of society. It's been a long and hard struggle and there is still more ground to cover. But baby, you've come a long way. The best place to begin our look at the women's movement is with the National Organization for Women, the nation's largest feminist organization. Founded back in 1966, NOW's membership today totals more than 250,000, with 800 chapters in all 50 states. NOW is probably best known for its unsuccessful efforts to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Nonetheless, the women's movement has made many advances. Women are now able to enter most professions, for example, the space field, like astronaut Sally Ride. Women are now voting in record numbers. And as recent as 1984, a woman sought election to the second highest office in the country. Many women involved in the feminist movement will tell you that their struggle has been long and advances have been made. But they will also tell you that their work is far from done. Women do not yet have economic equity. And all too many still suffer the impoverishment that results from the twin evils of wage discrimination and job segregation. And the Reagan administration attacks on pay equity and affirmative action will worsen that reality. Women still suffer economic disadvantage from a profiteering, sex-biased insurance industry, from woefully inadequate child care and dependent care programs, and from an archaic social security system that still does not recognize marriage as an economic partnership and that robs women of the dignity and security that should be theirs in their old age. Women are still beaten and raped at a rate that has not decreased in years, and that still stands ignominiously as a national disgrace, and women are reviled in pornographic materials. Women of color continue to fight against double discrimination, and our minority sisters and brothers both are disproportionately burdened by the punishing effects of poverty and racism that blight their opportunities and aspirations. This past summer, Goldsmith lost her position as president of NOW. Many of her critics, including her chief opponent, Eleanor Schmiel, felt that the women's movement was losing ground and visibility. One Louisiana NOW member who feels that the movement has lost ground is Sybil Taylor of Baton Rouge. There is a lot of uh, retrogression, but what we're having to deal with in terms of the women's movement is the same thing that blacks are having to deal with. Women now, or young women I should say, do not recognize the struggle that some of us have put in prior to their, they just take everything for granted. And it's a matter of educating them and making them realize that nothing comes without sacrifice and nothing is forever. And the fight for freedom is a constant fight that has to be fought with every generation, otherwise it will dissipate. And I think that's more of what we're having to face, which is a struggle within ourselves. In the 60s, we marched, uh, we picketed, we boycotted, 
Now the fight is in the halls of the legislature. So it's a more serene fight, but it's still a fight and still a struggle. And I won't say it's not as dynamic, because those of us who are still out there fight just as hard and just as avidly as we did in the beginning. But leaders in the feminist movement are beginning to fight back and move forward, like Lois DeBerry, the first black woman to serve in the Tennessee House of Representatives and president of the National Caucus of Black Women. Women, we might as well face and acknowledge what it is that we are looking for. We are looking at a president who called word is special interest. And everybody knows who and what he is talking about. Affirmative action, EEOC, breakfast and lunch programs, small farmers, small, small businesses, Blacks, Hispanics, Asian, North American, women and ERA, public housing and education, full employment, voters enforcement, peace, the environment, the vote stuck at the bottom, and the poor of our nation. All of these people who constitute the new majority in our nation are considered to be a special interest by the Reagan forces. Yes. We, the new majority, must build a political movement. We must build upon the experiences, the successes, the failures, the lesson learned, and translate that into a women political action agenda for 1986. As the new president of now, Eleanor Schmiel plans to take the women's movement back to the streets. And I think that, it is, that, that, that the membership and the leadership of this organization felt that uh, we'd been good pretty long. <laughs> we tried that last year. Um, and it, it's time, really, to go back out in the streets. It's time to uh, organize. It's time to go on the campuses. It's time to show that we're the majority. They did not and have not been winning their victories on social issues. They've been winning them on economic issues. And they've been winning them, frankly, on a... Uh, an image of America that um, is somewhat contradictory because basically uh, I don't believe the average American for any for one minute wants their daughters or their uh, uh, or the woman of this nation to get paid less or to um, uh, to go backwards but on the other hand that is the exact policy of the Reagan uh, right why do they have to project one image and do another because their real deeds are not popular and if those real deeds are exposed, in my opinion, they will not stay on the test of time. So I think it's time to put a lot more heat on the right wing and on the uh, reactionary policies of this administration. And that's what we intend to do. I believe that organizations have to change positions with time. Uh, you know, in the last decade, like I said, we've used the, the legislative route. And we've realized some gains. But clearly, times have changed, and I don't think that the country is going to be as receptive to us as they've been the last decade. Therefore, I think our tactics have to change also, and I agree. We're going to have to, you know, organize. We're going to have to educate. We're going to have to demonstrate, because I believe that's what it's going to take, because times are changing, and if we are not to fade into the background, we're going to have to come up with new tactics. In the legislative process, you do not have mass participation, very unfortunately. And it is difficult to uh, encompass the grassroots. Whereas with, with organized demonstrations, with organized rallies, with organized boycotts, you did have that grassroots participation, that, that massive kind of input. And I believe that's what it's going to take again. And I believe that you know, if all of their energies and monies are going in those directions, they'll realize those kind of things again. Abortion is one issue that the feminist movement will be focusing a lot of attention on now that the Reagan administration is trying to overturn the Supreme Court ruling that affirms women's right to abortion. Here is a group of pro-lifers protesting the law on abortion outside the hotel of the recent National Organization for Women's Convention. But the issue of abortion is one that feminist leaders say they will not allow to be turned back. We have reached the point of no return on this issue.
We have, we have passed the point of compromise and we must drive home the message to Ronald Reagan, to the Supreme Court, to the Catholic hierarchy, to Jerry Falwell, and to all the anti-abortion extremists, and tell them that to elevate the value of insensate fetal life over that of women is a cynical perversion of compassionate human values. <laughs> that that to weep crocodile tears over a two-inch fetus and then to deny funding for nutritional assistance to poor hungry children is simply immoral. To presume to dictate to women what we may or may not do in the matter of reproductive choice, as if we were incapable of making these decisions ourselves, is an unbridled arrogance that we will never again tolerate. We will not go back. Well, one thing is for sure. The women's movement is still very much alive. I'm willing to bet that in the not too distant future, we'll be seeing some highly visible campaigns on issues such as abortion, pay equity, and oh yes, the Equal Rights Amendment. Time now for a question from the Folks Almanac. This week's question is about a husband-wife acting team who met in 1946 while performing in the play Jeb. They are probably best noted for their Broadway roles in Raisin in the Sun. Who are they? Well, we'll have the answer for you later in the program. Behind every successful company is a leader who knows how to bring out the best that his people and facility have to offer. Lieutenant General Arthur Gregg is such a leader. A former Deputy Chief of Staff for Logistics for the Army, he is now directing the operations at Cox Cable in New Orleans. The Vice President and General Manager of Cox Cable in New Orleans cuts a commanding figure. Commanding is something he does very well. Lieutenant General Arthur Gregg brings to Cox Cable his extensive experience from a long and outstanding career in the United States Armed Forces. I retired from the Army in 1981, uh, and I spent about uh, six months doing some private consulting work. And as a direct result of that effort, uh, I was asked to assume uh, the position of president of UCI Incorporated. Uh, which is a management company with responsibilities for providing managerial assistance to five fairly small companies. Uh, that provided a, a rather unique opportunity for me because we were able to provide some assistance to those companies that allowed them to grow and to become stronger. And I remained in that position for, for two years. But at the end of two years, I wanted a new challenge and uh, cable television has provided me with that new challenge. How would you contrast commanding a battalion of armed forces and managing a cable television station? Well, it's, it, it's, it's been a long time since I commanded a battalion, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, there are similarities. Uh, you know, we, we tend to look uh, at the military and the civilian sector and we think that there are great differences. Uh, and in terms of, of the management and the leadership, those differences are not as great when you really examine them. Uh, first of all, there is a mission. Uh, you must clearly have a clear mission, whether you're commanding a battalion or running Cox Cable New Orleans. And once you define that mission, uh, you organize uh, your staff uh, uh, to accomplish that mission. You select the, the, the kind of people that are that are capable of carrying out the various parts of that mission. And then it's, it's your job to, to set the standard and to, uh, to supervise and make sure that that mission is carried out in a, in a highly credible way. Uh, so the differences are not uh, very great. It's a management responsibility, taking ownership of something and making it happen. How has 
your, your career in the armed services prepared you for the managerial responsibilities that you've undertaken in the past five years? Well, when you really look at, at a service person today, uh, almost his entire career is in some part of management. Uh, starting as a, as a young second lieutenant, uh, you uh, command a platoon. Well, uh, you, you really uh, have people, uh, generally at the platoon level of uh, 20 to, to 32 people. You have equipment and you have a mission and you have to manage the people and manage your resources in a way to accomplish that mission. Uh, and as you proceed uh, up the line, uh, you, you continue to have uh, the same kind of managerial experiences, but at a different level. Cox Cable had its problems in the past, but under the General's leadership, Cox has progressed rapidly into an effective force in the New Orleans community. We've gone through some growing pains uh, and, and our challenge has been and continues to be to refine our system to take full advantage of all of the technical potential of the system in providing the best in cable service to our subscribers. That's our number one mission. That's our focus. Uh, our, our second primary focus uh, is on making Cox Cable uh, an enjoyable place, a, a rewarding experience for all of our employees. Uh, uh, you know, we, we really believe that they are our most important resources, uh, and, I, and I think that uh, we are building the, the kind of climate here that they do feel that they are part of this family, that they are important, uh, and they can find satisfaction in being a member of this team. And then, and then third, we have a tremendous responsibility to the community we are located in. Uh, New Orleans uh, has much to offer, and, and we are pleased that we are able to contribute to the community. Uh, and and with, with a great deal of support uh, to, the, to the black community here. You know, we employ about 300 people here at Cox Cable. Uh, and 68% and uh, of our workforce uh, is minority. And I think in, in a city where uh, employment in the private sector is averaging about 15% minority, this is a commendable uh, achievement. Uh, we, we also find that about 33% of all of our dollars that we spend for goods and services is placed with minority companies. And this has a tremendous economic uh, impact on the minority community as well as the city of New Orleans overall. Uh, as you're probably aware, uh, we contribute uh, to the city 5% of our gross income. Uh, and on top of that, we provide uh, 450 thousand uh, dollars uh, each year to support uh, the Community Access Corporation and, the, uh, and also to support the, the, the arts and, and other worthwhile uh, nonprofit activities here in the city of New Orleans. We provide uh, 25 $1,000 scholarships to graduating seniors who are interested in going on to college and uh, and majoring in some field of communication. And you know, uh, just recently I had the opportunity of awarding the scholarships and talking with some of the recipients of this year. Uh, and, and they're a fine group of young men and women. And in some cases, that $1,000 made the difference between them going to college or not going to college. Now obviously the $1,000 will not pay uh, for, for a year of college, but that along with their other resources perhaps made the difference and allowed some of them to go to college who would not otherwise have gone. So th these are some of the, the things that, that we're involved in as a, as a corporate citizen uh, in New Orleans, and I think that's a very, very important uh, part of our mission here. And then finally, like every company, we hope to make a reasonable return on our investment, uh, and I'm, uh, I, I'm optimistic that uh, 
uh, we going to do that in the years ahead? And uh, so I'm very pleased. Despite a demanding career, General Gregg managed to marry and has two daughters. In September, he and his wife celebrated their 35th wedding anniversary. We're now going to go back in time as we share with you one of our folks' flashbacks. Our flashback this week takes us back to 1983. In April of that year, we visited the Tourget de Beauce piano competition at Southern University Baton Rouge. It was there we heard the remarkable talent of Joel Martin of Princess Anne, Maryland. Time now for you Cheech and Chong lovers to meet a dynamic comedy team from New Orleans. They are Chikula and Ching, previously known as the Fabulous Chajawas, a knee-slapping, can't-stop-laughing, jump-and-shout, knock-em-out comedy show. After years of bouncing from club to club, they now perform regularly at their own restaurant and lounge called Cheeky Chinks. Cheeky Chinks on Rampart Street in New Orleans is a restaurant that has something for just about everyone. Good food, good music, and good laughs. The laughs are provided by the owner, Abraha Chink Chajua, and his friend Chikula Chajua, who build themselves as Chikula and Chink, New Orleans' only black professional comedy team. Both grew up in New Orleans. My mother said I was mischievous. All I knew is I was having fun. I was told I was mischievous. I, had, I used to always run away. Only when they'd get whipped, yeah, I would run away. Well, being in the foster home, you had more than one child, a set of children. And you get 10, 15 children and somebody do something and everybody have to get punished or whipped for it. Then after a while, you, if you're not doing anything, you got tired. And so I'd run away. But, uh, because I wouldn't tell on whoever else would do anything. You know, so nobody would say they did thing and they say, okay, Chink know who did. I wouldn't know, but I wouldn't tell on anybody. So we're going to whip you and I'd run away. And so I moved a lot. I started off doing comedy. You know, I, I, I kind of forgot that because it was a speech class, and we used to do a lot of little humor skits. And I don't know why, I didn't even know I had a flair for comedy, but I guess somebody else must have seen it in me. But I was always getting cast in these little short humor skits. And when I went to Booker Washington, we used to do operettas every year. And my first year, I got cast in the lead comedy role. The Crescent City gives a richness to their comedy routines, but what is funny to Chikula and Chink? Everything, mostly, everything has a funny part to it. There's a, uh, there's a, uh, a bad side and a good side to everything. And um, to me, it's always a funny side to anything. The same, I mean, with funerals, wake, death, life, and all, and people don't understand. I, I go to wakes and crack jokes, and people, you shouldn't say, you know, uh, why? Because the person is dead. If you enjoyed their life, if, you, if they enjoyed their life, and you enjoyed being around them, then why not laugh and joke about it? If they was here, you would be laughing and joking in the physical form they were here. You would. So they moved out the house they were in. What's funny? <laughs> That's a good question, because I don't know. I, sometimes I think we're still trying to find out what's funny, as we find out when we try out a lot of material. Uh, I like to laugh, and uh, I, I think I, make, I probably make people laugh more off stage than I do on stage. But to me, um, I like, I enjoy seeing other people laugh. I like to see people laugh for real, you know, when that old stomach muscle starts jumping and you can't control it. And I mean, you know, it's really a good hearty laugh. These two have much in common. They were born the same year, shared the same astrological sign, and both served in the Vietnam War. A team for more than 10 years, they met at the Free Southern Theater as stage technicians. He's fun, he's like a brother to me. We have fun together. You know? We have our arguments and up and down like most people. We've been together working with each other almost 15 years and Chikula and Chink about eight years. So anybody you be with that long, you have your arguments, your ups and downs. But we always, you know, because we're comedians and we always, one of us always think of something funny to get the other one laughed and so it don't last that long. Well, I think he's a good person. I think he's a, basically, I think that is what drew me to him. I think basically he's a good person. I know he's a very generous person. I know he's a very warm-hearted person. And, you know, I picked that up when we worked together at uh, Free Southern Theater. We were both technical assistants. And um, we built sets, and we did all the hard work at the theater. And uh, it's, it's interesting how our lives kind of parallel, too, because we both got out of high school. We're both 
I think the same age. We graduated around the same time. We both went into the military. We both emceed and did comedy while we were in the military, and then we kind of hooked up at the Free Southern Theater. These dramatic comedians rely heavily on skits and dramatic technique, breaking away from the traditional straight man, funny man format. Hi, Hi. Red beans and rice is a favorite food of most New Orleanians, and for good reason. Have you heard the one about the beautiful princess who married the handsome prince and had an unattractive baby? Excuse me, Your Majesty. But I'm wondering about this ugly little baby your daughter and I had. And uh, I figure it must be from your side of the family. Uh, maybe you can explain this. Well, my boy, there's one thing I forgot to tell you when you married my daughter. She was just a little bit pregnant. Not that much you notice. Just a little bit pregnant. Time now for the answer to our folks almanac question. This husband-wife acting team met in 1946 while performing in the play Jeb. They are probably best noted for their Broadway roles in Raisin in the Sun. Who are they? Well, the answer is Ruby Dee and Ossie Davis. Together they often give stage and television readings of poetry by such noted black poets as Langston Hughes, Gwendolyn Brooks, and Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Well, that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. We'll be back next week with stories from Shreveport and the Natchitoches areas, and we hope to see you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>